Welcome to our inaugural lecture of the LS Squared. This is the Liberal Arts Lecture Series. The NSCC LS Squared is designed to promote dialogue about topics relevant to the liberal arts disciplines, and it is a forum for the exchange and dissemination of ideas, a place to celebrate faculty projects and research, and a way to reach out and share our work with both the NSCC family and the broader community of which the college is part. If you would like to learn more or you would like to be made aware of future lectures, you can sign up for our email list on the worksheet that is right next to the awesome cookies. Awesome, awesome cookies. They are awesome. The brownies are good too. And without further ado, this semester's lecture will be given by Dr. Larry Davis. I am not Larry Davis. However, I am here to introduce Larry Davis. He is the professor and chair of the History, Government, and Economics Department. He teaches world and European history here at North Shore. His talk was inspired by a trip he took with North Shore students to France and Belgium this past July to study the history of World War I. Please feel free to ask questions at the end of his presentation and help yourself to the refreshments. Larry? Thank you very much. Everybody can hear me? Right. Thank you. It's like a TED talk. I get to walk around and kind of, you know, be cool. Um, um, students ask me all the time, why are you so morbid? Um, <clears throat> it's interesting because, um, you know, I specialize in uh, war and revolution, you know, in my teaching and research. And um, I find that um, in most of my classes, that's really, you know, the direction I go in you know, what has been the effect of war and revolution on modern history. And um, over the past uh, few months, I've been thinking, you know, very deeply about the role of World War I, you know, uh, in modern history. And this was really inspired by a trip I took uh, uh, this past July to France and Belgium as part of uh, my department's uh, history travel seminar. And I see some of my students uh, representing here. Hands up high. All right, they survived, right? They survived. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of our exploits when we get there. Now, um, World War I is really a pivotal moment in world history. Um, and certainly for historians, it's much more important than World War II. For Americans, World War II is more important. Uh, but for the rest of the world, it's World War I, especially for Europeans. And the reason for that is we start to see for the first time in history uh, mass killing. Okay, that um, so, um, soldiers um, are involved in the industrial killing of others, you know, through the machine gun, through long range weapons, etc. Okay, uh, number two, it's the first war where um, civilians are targeted for, for murder, execution, atrocity. Okay, the first genocide in wor uh, modern world history took place in Armenia in 19, um, you know, in Turkey where Armenians were slaughtered by the Turks in 1915 and 1916, okay? Out of World War I, we see the rise of communism, Nazism, right? Um, you know, very, very um, dangerous ideologies. So it's, a, it's, and also really the way wars are fought, you know, the template is really set by World War I, okay? So think of massive armies, millions of men uh, fighting. Um, using industrial weapons, you know, industrial, industrially made weapons. Think of civilians being targeted, okay? Um, World War II is really a continuation of this model, this type of warfare. Uh, and what I'm gonna do over the next uh, few minutes is really try to um, give you a good idea as to why, you know, we need to really look very closely at World War I. I think um, a good place to start would be some of the poetry of Vera Britton. Vera Britton was a British nurse, okay, who served in France, okay, and she wrote a famous book in 1933 called Testament of Youth, and I think that um, even though she wasn't a soldier, okay, she really sums up what it meant to be part of this lost generation, okay. The people who survived World War I, okay, witnessed the murder of millions, okay, uh, men killing each other in the battlefield, civilians being slaughtered, okay? And this generation has always been called the lost generation, okay? 
And for her, um, it's a matter of kind of wandering around like ghosts, not feeling really connected to anything. The war has really cut everyone adrift. There's nothing to believe in anymore, okay? Our leaders let us down. Our military leaders let us down, okay? And this is something very, very uh, important to, um, to think about. So um, four touchstones, uh, basic touchstones of this talk. Uh, number one, we'll talk about the experience of soldiers and the need to put a human face on the statistics. Okay, I'm going to show you some stats from World War I that are quite um, jarring. Number two, we'll talk about the brutalization of soldiers and the terror of battle. Okay, I think that now we, that we live in a militarized society, we need to really understand what it means to put soldiers in harm's way, men or women. Okay, we live in a society where war has now become an option that is constantly on the table when it comes to foreign affairs. It used to be something that um, Americans thought of, uh, you know, very wary of um, early in its history. But if you look at American culture over the past 20 years, especially since the, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, war has sort of um, become kind of a constant crisis. Are we going to war? Are we sending troops? This is something we need to really be aware of. And I think what I want to try to do is draw out some of the lessons from uh, World War I, the most devastating war um, you know, known before World War II. Okay. Uh, next, I'm not going to uh, lecture about the entire history of World War I. I can't do it. Okay? I can't give you the narrative of every single battle. Uh, you'll be asleep like that. Okay? We want you to be awake so you can answer questions, eat goodies, you know, learn something, really get something out of the talk. So, um, what I'm going to do is focus on battles where the British, French, and Americans, who were allies, were fighting the Germans. Okay? We're going to keep it simple. I'm not going to um, you know, um, focus on you know, how the war started or anything like that. I think that um, I can give you resources after the lecture if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Okay. And then um, finally, I'll talk about memory and World War I, you know, how um, the dead have been memorialized uh, in France you know, by uh, Americans, French, uh, and Germans. Okay? And then talk about some of the exploits of the History Travel Seminar. Okay? And hopefully some of uh, my students from that trip may want to share some of their recollections, maybe after the talk, okay? Uh, it really was a very interesting, fascinating, if exhausting trip, am I right? Yeah, we survived it. Yeah. The first few days we, we were in uh, uh, France and Belgium, it rained, and it was like, what, 25 degrees below normal? So we're walking around freezing, and we're walking through trenches and all this kind of stuff, and it felt like we were there. It felt like it was 1917 all over again. Um, so it really was, um, you know, quite a, quite, a, um, quite a trip. Okay. All right. So very quickly, um, where did we travel when we were in France? Um, and what areas am I talking about in my, in my lecture here? We landed in Paris in the north. And then we drove uh, toward Lille. It didn't quite get that far. And then we swung to Brussels and then down through Luxembourg. Okay, and then very close to Strasbourg, and then back to Paris. Okay, so on this map, it's northern France and northeast France. Okay, this is really where the Western Front was located between 1914 and 1918. So I'll be focusing on the Western Front. Okay, the Germans attacked from Belgium, right, from, you know, from uh, the east, and uh, the French, British, and Americans are holding the line in the west, okay? So we're talking about a very, very relatively small area for the purposes of this talk. So what we did as a seminar is we basically, uh, you know, retraced the battles uh, in this particular region. You know, Verdun, uh, Bellow Wood, you know, uh, the Somme, places like that, okay? Okay. So let's start with statistics, okay? You know, what kind of statistics were generated by the war? 
Okay, take a look at these for a second. Okay. All right. Kind of absorb them. I say approximate because it's very difficult to get an exact number of how many soldiers were killed, wounded, how many civilians were killed or wounded. A lot of soldiers went missing, okay? A lot of them, their bodies were never found, okay? One thing to bear in mind, um, three quarters of soldiers killed in battle were killed by artillery. So when their bodies were found, they were in pieces, literally. Okay, which made counting the number of dead that much more difficult. I don't have to read these to you. These are staggering, right? August 22nd, 1914, 27,000 French soldiers killed. Okay, first major battle between the French and the Germans, 27,000 casualties. The worst day in French military history. Okay. Can you imagine, God forbid, getting word from Iraq that 27,000 American soldiers were killed on one day. Think about the psychological impact that would have on us, right? Think about the number of families affected, okay? The war in Iraq was bloody enough. I, don't, I mean, many people in this room fought there and know a lot about it. But um, imagine killing on such a, such a huge scale. July 1st, 1916. The worst day in British military history. Okay. Right. Battle of Verdun. Okay. From February to December 1916, 337,000 Germans killed or wounded. Very famous quote, some of you may have heard. Um, when one person dies, that's a tragedy. When a million die, that's statistics. Okay? Uh, and I've learned over the last 20 years of teaching uh, to be very wary about just throwing statistics around because we tend to do that. Oh, that, about, about what, three million people died? Uh, something like that, three or four, I don't know. But behind those stats are people, are human beings. And what I'm gonna do is really draw that out and uh, put a human face on those statistics for you. Here's a good example of putting a face to the, to the, uh, the stats, okay? How did the British government get people, get young men, and actually not so young men, to join the army, okay? This is what the British army promised. If you join up, you can join up with your mates. And you can serve in the same platoon, battalion, et cetera, with them. So, this, so you saw British men sign up in droves. They signed up with their soccer clubs, uh, with guys they worked with, with men at the pub they used to hang out with, men in their neighborhood, their mates, okay? Now look at the casualty rates in the previous slide, okay? What happened to a lot of those guys? wiped out together. So you had whole neighborhoods wiped out, whole soccer leagues wiped out, okay? Because they're, 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 they're serving together. And nobody can imagine in 1914 how horrendous this war is gonna be, okay? You got the machine gun, long range weapons, gas, all of this stuff, okay? Which makes this uh, war incredibly destructive. Classic poster right here, folks. Have you ever seen this one? Yeah? No? Classic. Okay. Um, very important army recruiting uh, poster. And we can see, okay, <clears throat> that historians um, are really focused today, oh, what happened here? Okay. On how the war brutalized and terrorized soldiers and civilians. Okay. So historians really don't care anymore about who started the war, okay? They did that for, for decades after the war ended. Who started it? Big fights about that. Was it the Germans? Or okay, now the horror of the war and what it means 
has really become the most important concern. So if we take a look at um, this poster, okay, it's the, the ape is actually meant to represent the German emperor or Kaiser, Wilhelm II, okay? Uh, the ape actually has a mustache. It may be hard to see when you're sitting, he's got a mustache, okay? And he's wearing a helmet with a point on it, which was uh, the German style of helmet, okay? And he's holding a woman, okay, who is partially clothed or partially nude, okay? And the woman may represent one of two things, uh, Lady Liberty, you know, um, a representation of liberty, or she could also be taken literally that the Germans are doing what to poor innocent women? You know, they're hurting them, they're molesting them, they're raping them, they're doing, you know, all kinds of terrible things, okay? And we can see the Kaiser isn't even human, okay? He's an ape, okay? And behind him, you can see civilization is, is in a shambles. Civilization is gone, it's over. So what we see happening here, okay, is really a new trend in modern warfare. If you look at that second uh, bullet point there, the goal is to exterminate the enemy because the enemy is no longer your adversary. They're of a different race than you are. Okay? And that's a very, very disturbing change in the way humans fight. Okay? It's no longer, I respect my enemy, and when I lose, I give him my sword, right? Uh, as a, and he keeps it as a memento of the victory. Now, you're, a, you're not just the enemy, you're a different race than I am. Okay? You're different. You don't deserve to exist. Okay? And we see this kind of thinking in Nazi ideology, right? So this is really where, where World War I is incredibly important for us for understanding the entire 20th century. Okay? So there's many, many reasons here that we need to sort of pay attention. Okay? That's a great poster. Okay. This is very, very interesting. Um, Stéphane Audouin Rousseau and Annette Becker wrote a, a wonderful book, Understanding the Great War. And here they really lay out okay, um, some very, very interesting points. Okay. And what they're trying to say is, um, what do we do with the war in terms of human nature? Okay. Are, is there something intrinsically wrong? with human nature, okay? And this radical new violence was not only massively accepted by the belligerent societies, but was also imp implemented by millions of men over four and a half years. Even more troubling, reality moved from a social state where violence had become very controlled, repressed, to a state of war where extreme violence had free reign. In a matter of days, Europeans who had benefited from the civilizing process left their work, their families, and their often sophisticated, cultivated social life to accept extreme violence, okay? So what did it take for that mailman to one day be delivering the mail, and then three weeks later, four weeks later, he's in a trench, right? Aiming to kill somebody on the other side, okay? Or he's firing bombs uh, that's killing civilians, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very, very um, interesting question we all need to ask, okay? What do we do with this? Why do we kill? Why do we go to war? Why do we accept it so easily? We accept killing and horror and violence of war a little too readily. And it's not just American culture. It's, we're talking we'll go back to 1914, where this kind of violence was accepted uh, and seen as kind of, uh, after a while, the norm. When violence becomes the norm, that's problematic. All right. um, here's an interesting example of this. Um, this here is um, what is called a stereo card. Um, anybody from the 70s remember uh, the viewfinders? You know, we have a, these images and you put them in a little viewfinder, right? And you could, you know, just click it, these images. Um, if you look on eBay, maybe you can find some. But here uh, in 1914, stereo cards were very, very popular. Okay? And you could actually get a reader. You know, you'd look into the reader, and the, dub the double images would allow you to see the image in 3D. Okay? And you could click through these kinds of images. Okay? 
So what does it say about how civilians were viewing the war? Okay, why the obsession with taking pictures of dead soldiers, selling it, it's almost like commercializing the killing, okay, and allowing civilians to kind of see the war through these viewfinders, okay? Um, if you're, uh, you know, taking a look at a dead soldier and you're an American, were you cheering? You know, was it a good thing? Were you looking at it kind of perplexed? Were you disturbed by these images? Okay, you know, what was it about, you know, this media obsession that we see really beginning in World War I? Um, when we went to um, different museums in, in France and Belgium, we saw all over the place, right? Incredible pictures taken from the time that were incredibly disturbing. Um, so there's like, a, it's almost like a way to catalog, you know, catalog the killing. Take a look at this. Um, Ernst Jünger was the most famous German soldier of, of World War I bar none. He fought at the front for close to four years. Okay? Um, the only reason he stopped is because near the end of the war he gets shot and, and, and uh, it punctured his lung and he actually had to stop fighting. Okay? Now, some soldiers came back from the war and said, war is the worst hell ever. I never want to go back. It, you know, it, I'm a pacifist. I've seen so much carnage and destruction. Junger is part of the lost generation, okay, who believed that war was a good thing, okay? He was a member of a German military outfit called the Fry Corps, or the Free Corps, and they were the guys who were called upon to volunteer for the most dangerous missions, okay? So if you needed a bunch of guys to do a mission that most likely would get you killed, he's the first one with his hand in the air. I'll go do it. And for Junger, he believed that, um, I gotta read this, it's so, it's so, it's so crazy. If you, read his, if you read his diary, it'll blow your mind. Um, he basically said that um, uh, to achieve the highest state of being as a man, you must face death on the battlefield and walk away. The highest state of existence is walking through the hell of battle when the bullets are flying and the bombs are dropping and people are getting, you know, blown to smithereens all around you, and at the end of the day, walking away. You can look death in the face and smile and say, I beat you. And after the war, he actually became um, an inspiration to the Nazi party because the Nazis actually celebrated these, these kinds of military values that Ernst, Ernst Jünger you know, celebrated. He didn't become a Nazi himself, uh, and he ended up dying at 102 years old. He only died like 15 years ago. Okay? Um, it's almost like the guy was inhuman, you know. Um, so the lost generation, you know, isn't all about war is bad, war, you know, war should be avoided. Some of them thought that it was the greatest moment of their lives. And this guy was at the front almost four years, okay, as an officer. Other soldiers didn't fare so well, okay? Uh, we're talking about the first war where PT what we call PTSD was first diagnosed, okay? Back then they called it shell shock, okay? And you can see here the soldier is clearly um, distressed, okay? like clearly not ready for another turn uh, at the front, all right? Um, electric shock therapy was very common, you know, to cure um, um, shell shock. Okay, soldiers suffered terribly in hospitals uh, where doctors, you know, they knew that something traumatic was going on uh, in the psyche but didn't know much about how to, uh, to cure it. Siegfried's a good, uh, Sassoon is a good example of um, a British soldier who's also a poet 
who decided early on that the war was the biggest joke in the world. And it was a joke that was being perpetrated by, usually by the officers and other leaders, against the soldiers. Uh, so he was one who became a lifelong advocate of, of um, peace and uh, pacifism. But um, I always liked this particular piece. Good morning, good morning, the general said when we met him last week on our way to the line. Now the soldiers he smiled at are most of them dead. And we're cursing his staff for incompetent swine. He's a cherry-o card, grunted Harry to Jack as they slogged up to Arras with rifle and pack. But he did for them both by his plan of attack. So what is he hinting at? What happened to Harry and Jack, right? Arras was the last place that they're going to see before being killed. Okay, and there are millions of other examples from Sassoon that are really, really good uh, anti-war stuff. So he becomes one of the most important poets um, dealing with the terror and carnage that he sees all around him. Okay, he was another guy who um, hated the war, couldn't stand what was going on, thought the generals were idiots, but when he got wounded, he couldn't wait to get back to the front uh, to, um, to be with his comrades because he was afraid that they would, they would be lost without him. Uh, and he, he almost got, got killed on a few occasions. But he did survive the war. This here um, is a brilliant uh, um, snippet from Gabriel Chevalier, who wrote um, a book called Fear, a novel of World War I, which is based on his um, experiences as a soldier. Okay. Um, look at the language he uses. We had just marched over a crest of a hill, and suddenly there before us lay the front line, roaring with all its mouths of fire, blazing like some infernal factory where monstrous crucibles melted human flesh into a bloody lava. We shuddered at the thought that we were nothing but more, more, but more coal to be shoveled into this furnace. It was as if an evil spirit was stoking up the flames in some devil's punch bowl dancing naked and snaring in our destruction, okay? This novel was based on his experiences, and it's very, very rich in its description of what it was like to be a soldier um, coming into battle for the first time. I can only, you know, it's, it's very vivid. You can imagine, right? You know, the, 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 the shells exploding, the bodies whipping, the men being, you know, chewed up, okay? Uh, human flesh into bloody lava. I mean, what an image that is. Right. Okay. Let me switch gears here. Um, I've given you kind of the the blood and guts. Okay. Um, and I wanted to uh, switch, uh, you know, switch gears here and talk about the lost generation in memory, and uh, bring in some of the exploits of uh, our group from from last summer here. Um, now, the question we tried to grapple with uh, uh, as we, we, you know, busted through uh, the, all the battle sites, memorial sites, uh, museums of, of France and Belgium, uh, why memorialize the dead? You know, why do we memorialize the dead? What's the point? What's the purpose? And for Europeans, it's not just the sheer number of those who were killed. We saw the statistics, right? We saw what people you know, had to deal with. In European history, okay, the Great War is family history. Okay? The Great War is family history. Think about it. If you had 9 million soldiers killed, if you had 30 million men mobilized, you had nurses who served at the front. Um, in the Russian army, you actually had women serve as frontline soldiers. Right? You know, when you think of the, how many people are wounded psychologically uh, and also physically, think about how that reverberates throughout society. When one soldier is killed and wounded, how many people does it affect? Like, you know, if you drop a pebble into a pond, right, and you see, you know, how it, how it kind of just, you know, spreads out, it affects uh, not only families but neighborhoods. It's something very, very important to remember, that World War I is also a major part of the family history of Europeans. 
Everybody in the family has a story to tell about grandpa fought in the war, my great-grandfather, my uncle, my father, whatever the case may be, or they were wounded, um, you know, you name it. It's just a major part of, uh, of the culture. It's a major part of the way that people see the past through their families, what their family suffered through, okay? okay? So along the commemoration road with the History Travel Seminar, um, we're going to start with um, kind of an overview here. So uh, from July 9th to the 20th, um, students and faculty from North Shore and Salem State toured the battlefields, museums, and monuments dedicated to the history and commemoration of World War I soldiers and civilians. Okay? And I'm looking at my, my uh, group of, of compatriots. We hit just about every one, didn't we? Yeah. It was like actually being in the Army trudging through these different sites, right? Um, I mean, it was a very busy trip, okay? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that, okay? About uh, this, this seminar. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Battle of Verdun, okay? Because we did spend a lot of time at Verdun, where a major, major battle took place, one of the most important battles of World War I. And uh, we'll look at how the French, Americans, and Germans memorialized uh, their war dead. Um, so here is um, a, a picture of a German soldier at the Battle of Verdun. Okay? He's in a trench, and he's lying next to a um, French soldier who has literally been cut in half. Okay? Now, take a look at not only this picture in terms of the physical pain and suffering, right, that the soldier who died felt, right? But also take a look at the environment around the soldier, right? What did the war do to the environment? Okay? That's another question, you know? I'm, I'm focusing on what war does to the psyche, what it does to the body, but how about to the environment? All right, so we're going to take a look at the Battle of Verdun, which was incredibly... Uh, bloody, as I mentioned before, 337,000 Germans were killed or wounded. The exact same number of French, just about, were killed or wounded. So altogether, about a quarter of a million dead or wounded at the Battle of Verdun. Okay, quarter of a million. That's about 700,000 roughly. Okay, 350,000 Americans were killed in World War II. Okay, we're talking 700,000 killed or wounded in one battle in World War I. That gives you an idea of the scale of the, of the killing. Here we visited the uh, Battle of Verdun Douaumont Memorial and Ossuary. And you can see the ossuary in the back, you know, that, that, that lovely column there. And in the foreground, you can see um, all of the um, gravestones that are in the front of the ossuary. Um, there are 16,142 of these graves. Okay, Six, over 16,000. And you can see something very interesting here, that you have these graves in the front with a little minaret on the top, right? These are Muslim soldiers who uh, died fighting for France. They were from Morocco, Tunisia, places like that, Algeria, okay? And we see the, the Christian crosses facing this way, and then the Muslim facing this way toward Mecca, okay? That's a talk for another day, you know, the, the role that... Uh, that uh, Muslim soldiers and soldiers from the empire played fighting in France. Uh, but that was a very, very interesting thing that uh, we didn't expect, the large number of Muslim soldiers killed fighting for France okay. from, from the colonies. Okay. okay, as I mentioned before, the um, Verdun Memorial is an ossuary, which is a place where bones are kept and memorialized. There are about 130,000 bones of unidentified German and French soldiers who were killed at Verdun. And when you look into these columns uh, around the back of the building, you just see piles and piles of, of just bones, okay? I mean, you name it, skulls, the whole thing, right? I see you're smiling because you like the Osiere, I know. You. <laughs> okay. We like the ossuary, uh, yeah, uh, we found that fascinating, right? 
So one way to really memorialize and to really kind of shake you is to, is to look, at these, look at these bones. Okay, um, here is an entrance to the Bayonet Trench at Verdun, uh, a famous uh, landmark. Around Verdun today, you have a series of very, very impressive memorials. And here we have uh, a couple of uh, our intrepid travelers here standing in front of the trench. It was actually um, a memorial that was built by the Americans, okay, for the French, in honor of the French who died at Verdun. And um, if we take a look at the trench here, this is what it looks like when you walk when you walk inside those portals. And this is a good example of how the lost generation has been mythologized, those soldiers who, who were killed in the war. Um, for generations, okay, the bayonet trench story was this. During the Battle of Verdun, a group of about eight or ten French soldiers were standing in a trench with their bayonets fixed, getting ready to to actually get out of the trench and run and attack the Germans, okay? So they're fixed. Right before they were gonna leave the trench, a huge bomb landed in front of the trench, a huge shell, covered the trench and suffocated them. And the only thing that was left of them was the bayonet sticking up out of the ground, okay? And that became part of French um, mythologizing about the war, right? Because one thing that we do to the dead is we, we sort of use myth to explain the horrors of the war and the heroism of soldiers who fought it. Now, historians have done research on, on this particular myth, and uh, one particular interpretation uh, that uh, Jay Winter came up with, he's a famous uh, historian, uh, he came up with, was, was, very, very, was very interesting. His interpretation is this, looking at the evidence from the German archives, all right? Soldiers, French soldiers were standing at the trench, ready to advance. A bomb hit the trench, killed the French, right? Those soldiers were killed outright. A German patrol was coming along, saw what happened, okay? Threw dirt on the soldiers to cover them up. And then the Germans took their bayonets and put them into the ground. So that when the, when, the, when the battle was over, or there was a lull in the battle, the French would know that there were, they had soldiers buried who needed proper burial, who were covered, who needed proper burial, okay? That often, very often happened. Enemy soldiers would see something like that happen and would notify their enemies. You know, you've got 20 guys who need to be buried, out of respect. There was, that, there was such a thing. Uh, during the war, but the bayonet trench myth still lives on. You'll see on the internet, you know, that people still think it has something to do with these men, you know, bravely dying with the bayonet still, you know, uh, in their hands, but it's actually the Germans came along and put their bayonets to, to alert the French that there were men who needed to be buried properly. Okay. Um, right near, um, Verdun is um, a town called Fleury, okay? Uh, Fleury no longer exists. It was totally destroyed during the Battle of Verdun, okay? I mean, nothing was left standing. The only thing left standing there today is the church in the back. That's a memorial church built after the war. And as you walk along these paved paths, you can see little markers that tell you what stood before the war, you know, the bakery, you know, um, the, uh, the, you know, the cafes, yeah, right, so-and-so's, so you know, farm, that kind of stuff. So you walk across and you can just sort of see, you know, like a small forest that's 100 years old growing up, you know, where the town used to be. And what the French government did was, in order to uh, keep the memory of this town alive, they didn't erase it from French maps. Now, there are about eight such towns in that area that were flattened that the French keep on the maps as though they're still, they're still in existence. Now, F uh, Fleury actually has a mayor, okay? The French government appoints a mayor every so many years of the town, okay? To show respect for those who died and to respect the, the memory of the town. Okay. 
And um, here uh, are two examples of shell craters that were made by bombs during World War I. And, and my students will tell you, we couldn't walk everywhere, right? We had to be very careful. Uh, when you're walking in this part of France and Belgium, you cannot walk off the trails. Because ba ba boom you know? Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But think about the environmental damage, right? But these craters are all over the place, you know? Okay. Um, here's a very interesting uh, memorial at a German site. Um, the Grieving Parents by Kata Kolwitz. Okay, uh, now Kolwitz was a famous artist, okay, and uh, she was well known before World War I and was a professor of art as well at one of Berlin's most famous art institutes. In uh, 1914, her 18-year-old son, the apple of her eye, no doubt, says, I'm joining the, 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 the army. And she said, absolutely not, don't want you to go to war, please don't go. He was killed within the first few months of the war. 18 years old. So as an artist, how is she going to exp express her grief, right? So she actually made these statues that really represent her and her husband, okay? Um, grieving over the loss of their, of their son. And it's supposed to be universal. All parents grieving over the loss of their, of their dead sons. Now, the father figure, okay, is actually peering down over her son's grave, Peter. Peter Kolwitz is actually buried in a grave right in front of, of the statues. So literally, it's a representation of her, the grieving right at the grave of, of their lost son. Very powerful, very, very moving. Okay. Okay. Uh, here is the uh, Muse Argonne Cemetery, the largest cemetery in Europe. Uh, the largest American cemetery in Europe. Many Americans think that the uh, Normandy cemeteries are the largest American military cemeteries in Europe. Not true, it's this one, okay? Uh, it's this one, okay? A, a World War I cemetery. Um, there are 14,246 American dead in this cemetery. And unlike the German cemeteries, which are kind of quiet and somber, uh, this, you know, the American is kind of big and grandiose, you know, and, and, and really just um, really kind of overwhelming. Now, on both sides of that um, lawn are crosses that stretch as far as the eye can see. You can't even see the end of the line. I mean, it's really qu quite, um, quite amazing. This is the inside of the chapel um, at that memorial in Use Our Gun. It's very, very... Um, very ornate, very beautiful, with the names on the walls of all the men who died in that battle. Okay. Here is outside, um, you know, next to the lawn I was showing you. You just see crosses from, you know, just as far as the eye can see, it's very quiet, very somber, very, very beautiful. Very, very well kept, too. And um, as we walked through, and my, my students can... can uh, you know, speak to this as well, you know, we, you get to read the gravestones of uh, the young people who died, the young men who died, and you come across ones that kind of, you know, shake you, that kind of, you know, make you stop. And this uh, um, soldier, Frederick Lewis, was a private from New York, and uh, he died on October 15th, 1918. The war died, no the war ended November 11th, 1918. And we saw people who died a week before the war ended, three days before the war ended. You know what I mean? Just heartbreaking. 18 years old, 19 years old, 20 years old, okay? Some who died, um, you know, in 1919 of their wounds. You know, very, very um, difficult stuff. And I think it took a toll on us, didn't it? After a while, you know, um, we felt like we had been through a war after, after studying all this kind of stuff. So I'm going to start to wind down now so we can um, ask some questions and, and get, some, get some food. Um, I wanted to talk to you about one final um, characteristic of uh, understanding World War I, uh, the iron harvest, the war lives on. Okay, so a couple more slides and we'll be done. Okay. 
Okay. 1917, the Battle of Passchendaele in Belgium, the British alone fired more than four million shells in one battle, four million. Okay, just constantly, right? Up to 30% of the artillery shells fired never exploded and still rest in the earth in northern France and in Belgium. Okay, think about that for a minute. I don't, I don't know anything about math, I'm terrible at math. But I think 30% out of that number is kind of, like, kind of, really kind of big. <laughs> and kind of scary, right? And 96 years after the war, people in France and Belgium are occasionally killed from unexploded ordnance. Okay, it's called the Iron Harvest. Okay, this is basically what happens, okay? Uh, in the wintertime, the soil freezes and it forces the the shells, these unexploded, unexploded bombs, to the surface. So in the spring, when it's time to clear your farm, you see, you know, you, 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 sometimes you plow into them, and sometimes, you know, they're duds, nothing happens, sometimes they explode, okay? Um, here's, a, okay. here's a pile of shells uh, that were found in a farm near Tipval, France. We went to Tipval. Um, on average, some farmers may, may pull 30, 40, 50 shells out of the ground every year, every season. And they have special bomb squads in France and Belgium who come along and collect them. And they go to a nearby military base and they explode them. They blow them up. And they teach the farmers, if the shell looks like this, don't touch it. Right? Because some of them still have their firing pieces in it. Um, this past summer, um, a French construction worker was killed. Bel uh, I'm sorry, a Belgian construction worker was killed at a work site. They were, they were laying a foundation for a building and dug right into an unexploded shell and he was killed. And this, this happens every so often, okay? Uh, think about the environmental damage of these bombs sitting in the soil, right? Now that's, 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 a, that's a, you know, a topic for a whole other talk. Um, okay. And here's a picture of us um, at uh, the Grand Place in uh, Belgium, okay, in Brussels. And you all remember the chocolate. Was it chocolate or oh, the, the waffles? The waffles. Yeah. We learned that uh, Brussels has good wa uh, waffles. Yeah. Right. And there was a war that happened there, around there, somewhere there. All right? All right. Okay. Um, many thanks to the following people um, who uh, and, you know, were very helpful in getting, getting this uh, talk together for me. Um, my, my students from uh, History Travel, the audience, thank you very much. Um, does anybody have any questions? Thank you for your patience. Yeah, Casey. When, when people are killed by the shells that are still on the ground, are they considered a casualty of World War I still? That's a great question. That's a great question. Um, not that I know of, no. No. Because they weren't killed in the battlefield situation. That's a good question. I don't know for sure. Other questions? Uh, French military can tell you that because when I was in France in 1962, there was a, an old German ordnance depot right outside of the city that I was stationed at. And every summer, every spring, and every fall, you'd have two, three, four, five people who would be walking across the, the fields and they'd have hand grenades and mortar shells blow, blow them up. So they're, they're not considered part of the, the war casualties, but they are a nuisance. And yeah. they're still finding unexploded bombs from some of the raids over Hamburg, Frankfurt, That's right. during World War II. And those, matter of fact, after World War II, they had specific squadrons and uh, specific ordnance people who were both Polish and British that would go around to various cities and dig up these bombs yeah. so that people wouldn't get killed. Yeah, that's right. Uh, it's, it's, it's not just a problem in France and Belgium, but right across Europe, yeah. Think about two world wars and the amount of bombs that were dropped. Uh, it's, it's a serious issue, yeah. There's a, a question behind you, Karen. 
most of the casualties in World War I, you said, were artillery. No, I, 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 about three quarters. Yeah. What about poison gas? I don't have numbers on that. Uh, I, I'm, I, could, I could certainly find out for you um, if you want to give me your contact info. I honestly don't know. That's a great question. That's a great question. How many died from poison gas? I honestly don't know. Danvers, Danvers, you want to take it? Danvers. Um, I was just wondering uh, if you could expand a little bit on the propaganda, especially in uh, America, because we, I know we looked at the uh, poster of the, the destroy the mad brute, but what else can you say about that? About propaganda? Yes. That's a great question. Um, propaganda um, is used for the first time why, in a widespread sense in World War I, okay? And it's used by the Americans, the British, the French, the Germans, the Russians. And the reason for that is um, World War I is really the first war where um, the draft is instituted, you know, conscription, where you're required to serve. You know, you get a draft notice and, you know, you've got a, you've got a, a report to the military. And one way that you generate support for the war effort is through propaganda, you know, through um, you know appeals to patriotism, you know, be a good American and and, uh, and sign up, um, all the way through this kind of racist stuff that we see, you know, um, join because uh, you're fighting a war against uh, subhumans or or people who are uncivilized, uh, and that you you know you are needed. To defend the nation from these brutes, you know, from these, uh, these, uh, you know, uh, people who are really out to destroy civilization, um, you know, that's that's really the, the main purpose for propaganda in World War One, you know, is to generate that kind of support. Um, in wars before that, you know, uh, before World War One, they were mostly fought by professional soldiers you know, who, who joined the military mostly because they had nothing else to do. They had no other skills. Um, and uh, the, mili the military was the best place for them. They earned a small salary uh, in, 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 all, in me three meals a day, three squares, you know. Um, but World War I, uh, because of the size of the armies that were needed, you know, uh, you had to start drafting people, you know, started requiring them to serve. Um, and you you know, it's much easier when people feel there's a reason to put the uniform on rather than forcing people to do it. Um, so that, that, does that answer your question? It's a very good question, very good question. Anybody else, questions? Hi, Jane. Hi, Larry, I might have missed this at the beginning. Um, my grandfather was in World War I, and then my really? father and his brothers were in World War II. And my grandfather, who was in World War I, um, encouraged all three of his sons to join when it was World War II. I guess my question is um, what you just said, how, and he's gone now, and, and mm -hmm. no, none of them ever talked about their experiences. Yeah. So how did he, he, he went into World War I, was in France, and then stayed in France after the war? And I'm just wondering, did he get um, drafted into the war, and how could he have stayed on afterwards? He, he came back year afterwards. Um, do you know anything the, about My how? understanding about World War I on um, the American side is that Americans had a lot of volunteers. They didn't, we didn't conscript to the extent that the, the Europeans did. Even the British held off drafting until about 1916 when they were starting to run out of bodies because so many people were getting killed. Uh, you know, volunteers started saying, I'm not volunteering for that. Um, most of the, the people that I know who have relatives you know, who fought in World War I you know, were volunteers. My great, my great uncle joined the Marines, you know, uh, during, during the war, World War I. Um, is, that, is that basically your question? Yeah, yeah, most, most likely he was a volunteer. Yeah, most likely he was a volunteer, depending on the outfit, too, you know, but, yeah. Danvers? Um, yeah, my question is, I know you said historians don't focus so much on the cause of World War I anymore, mm -hmm. but to my knowledge, it really started with terrorists of sorts um, 
killing the archbishop of one of the countries involved, is that really what sparked the war? Yeah, yeah, the killing of Archduke uh, Franz Ferdinand in Sarajevo. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so right. there was really no like global cause for everyone to start this massive kind of. That, that's right. That's right. There, there. Um, the nations who fought in the war had no national interest at stake to go to war okay. in 1914. All right. Why they all did? That's the great question. Maybe people felt their, that the national honor was at stake. Uh, because of that crisis, you know, the, I'm not going to go into the crisis of uh, the Archduke dying, but a lot of nations um, felt that their honor was at stake, and that the way you defend it is you go, you know, you go to war to defend it. Um, pretty big, you know, misstep. But my point is that um, there was no national interest at stake for any country in World War One. That's what makes it so darn tragic. We can make a, a very convincing case that we had to fight World War II. We had to fight the Nazis. You know, I mean, we had to fight Hitler. That, I, I, you can convince me of that like that. You know, it's, that's not even a question. World War I is much different. What makes it so tragic is, is that is fought for nothing. Okay. And when you think about, on the Western Front anyway, fighting in trenches, I mean, they only moved the line a few miles in each direction. It wasn't as though uh, there was a major breakthrough until the end of the war. You know, I mean, they stayed in their trenches and blew each other to smithereens for four years. And when the Americans came in 1917, the Americans did the same thing. The reason why 100,000 American troops died in the war is because when Americans got to France, they began running at the enemy into the machine guns and the French and the British said, guys, we, we've been doing that for three years. What are you, guys, what are you doing? You know what I mean? But there, were, there, were, there, there was no imagination to think beyond trench warfare at the time. You know what I mean? So even Americans kind of fell into that trap. And the British and French would say, if you guys want to keep running across no man's land into the machine guns, be my guest. We're going to kind of hunker down and wait for this thing to end. <laughs> you know? That's a good question. Um, thank you. Yeah, I just had a uh, comment. Uh, the Battle of Bella Wood is very important in Marine Corps history, and they yes, teach it, it uh, now because they battled for like three or four days straight. And yeah. after, the German soldiers called the Marines they fought uh, Devil Dogs. The Devil that's Dogs. That's where the, the name comes from. Yeah, there's a beautiful memorial at Bella Wood that we visited. Um, and uh, that hill that the Americans took. And there's actually a burned out building that the Germans were, were holed up in that the Americans took when they finally took that hill and took a lot of casualties to take it. And that's where they earned that, that name, the, the Devil Dogs. Yeah, yeah, we were on that spot. You know, uh, it, was, it was really quite moving. It's a beautiful museum there. I mean, I'm sorry, yeah, memorial, yeah. Hollywood. Any more in Danvers, Jessica? We do not have any more here. Okay. okay. Can I make one last oh, point? Oh, one more oh, question. Oh, yeah. By the way, this lecture, if, if anybody wants a copy of it, just I would be happy to email it to you. By the way, and also if you're interested in um, student study abroad travel, send me an email and I'll be happy to put you on the um, travel list for updates about upcoming travel. Yeah, um, Dean Messina. Good morning. This is, an, this is just a commentary on how important these type of programs are. I'm sitting here and I'm almost in tears watching it because it humanizes what war and what this type of what Larry and Cara and Carrie are doing in these series is humanizing each and every one of us. And my uncle, although he fought in World War II, um, it resonates because he was a, a POW and his leg was blown off and he came home as an amputee, almost a double amputee. And the way that he explained it to all of us is I never want to talk about war ever again. And he didn't until he was ready to die in his 90s. He said because it was a German that put me over his shoulder and carried me back to the camp 
and he kept saying to me, you are a swine, I hate you, but humanity tells me that I need to save you. Hmm. What a story. And, and he was saved, he would have died. And he was a POW when he came out, he said, so he's, his take on the war was all war is bad and no one wins. And we all come back and, and have our own scars and they didn't know PST or any of that at that time. But it's through his eyes that I really value these type of lectures and the human piece of it. Because we all have to remember that at the end of the day, no matter where we are in society, no matter how many years transcend, how many years go by, decades go by, at the end of the day, we are all human beings. And we should never devalue each other um, for any reason. So thank you so much. I'm well, thank so you very much for that you. comment. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Larry, we actually have And you've also, uh, Dean, the Messina's comments also illustrate how um, you know, World War I and II are family history for Americans, too. You've all demonstrated that, right? You know, that uh, the war is closer to us than we might think. Thank you all very much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you.